Welcome to Trending in Education. I'm Mike Palmer here. Excited today to be joined by two choreographers, two system thinkers, two innovators. Dan McClure and Jenny Wild are joining me today on the show. They're from an organization called Innovation Ecosystem. We're going to be hearing from each of them around their origin stories in a second. Before we get there, Dan and Jenny, welcome to Trending in Education. So nice to be here, Mike. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks. The right of initiation that we have for our guests on your first appearance, you generally get a pass in your subsequent appearances, is we'd like to ask for your origin story. In your own words, how did you get to this point in your professional life? Let's begin with you, Dan, and then and then follow up with, with Jenny. Tell us what got you to this point in your professional life. Well, what I discovered fairly early in my career, like the second week of my first real grown-up job, was that I was really miserable at doing normal jobs. So I was working as an engineer, designing big pipelines that ran across the U.S., and there was no reason anybody should have hired me for that job. And what I realized was that if I was going to survive in this role, I was going to have to do something differently. So I started creating a computer program to do my job, figuring that if I couldn't do my job, maybe I could program something that would. Nice. And the cool thing was, is that the federal government came in and saved me because they deregulated the industry. And it turned out my little computer program was the thing that the company needed to suddenly leap into this newly deregulated, reinvented industrial space. Mm. And so instead of being on the edge of being fired for being a not very good engineer, Mm. I suddenly was given an innovation team and told Mm. to let's help us reinvent this entire company and the industry. Yeah, And I got to do that for the next 10 years. And having figured out that I could do that as a job. I never went back to being just an engineer again. Yeah. Yeah. And that ultimately led to you founding the organization that you're part of now. Is that correct? Yeah. Although there's several decades worth of system innovation stuff stuck in between there. Yeah. But yeah, Jenny and I met basically four or five years ago at a conference in Berkeley and we were both doing big system innovation things. I I won't yeah. Step on Jenny's his story here. But once we realized we were really both looking at the question of how do you address big complex problems with ambitious, powerful solutions? Mm-hmm. And that kind of question and the techniques associated with that really were energizing both of us. Yeah. And we're going to want to dive into that more specifically around the learning implications and how do you teach people to be innovative? How do you teach them systems thinking in a bit? But before then, we want to hear your story as well, Jenny. Yeah, great. So I came into university and I was really set for changing the world. (laughs) What do I do? How do I change the world? At the time, I thought it was going to be in politics and I did a bit of work in Australian politics where I'm from. And then I was like, it's not going to be in politics. That's not the place for me. (laughs) Although I find it very interesting. And so I went, did a couple more things and decided, where am I going to change the world? And ended up at one of these multi-day testing interviews at the biggest NGO or not-for-profit at the time. And they ended up offering me a job in emergency operations. Mm -hmm. So big global disasters, typhoons, mm-hmm. earthquakes, etc. Mm-hmm. And I actually almost didn't take the job. I said, oh, really? Is this me? You know, I want to work on the deep, big stuff. I soon to realize actually diving into conflicts in Pakistan and typhoons in the Philippines and the Haiti earthquake and many other emergencies, that they are full of these big, deep, complex problems and huge opportunities for people's lives. And I loved it. I loved Mm. the work. And then met Dan and others and realized that actually all over business uh, and the world, there are these incredible opportunities and incredible threats that are just really interesting big problems where we can make change. Mm -hmm. So slightly turned down the change the world and then up to the, (laughs) how do you think about bigger things? Yeah. Yeah. And then that perspective, it, it sounds like there was a shared perspective. One 
theme that I've been noticing more on the show lately is, you know, there is a focus that continues to be there around skills, but then there is also renewed focus around mindsets and higher level ways of thinking. One of the higher level ways of thinking that folks have been very focused on is systems thinking. There's more awareness. Even if you look in the U.S., there was a lot of talk about systemic racism. The idea that these systems exist outside of individuals. And in some ways that comes with the notion that systems are harder to change because it's harder to find the individual, the wizard behind the curtain, who's actually operating the whole thing. Maybe beginning with you, Dan, can you introduce our audience a bit to the conceptual framework around systems thinking and, and who you've been working with and, and how you attack some of the problems? Yeah. So I think it's systems thinking, systems innovation is a new and evolving field in the sense of something that's being applied practically out in the world. In many ways, this has been, has been a subject that's been talked about for a number of decades now, mm -hmm. but oftentimes it's been in a rather academic context mm -hmm. or a very PhD, we've got computer programs and we're going to analyze all the possible little bits. And what you said is about it seeming hard and seeming to be complex. That's, I think, often what puts people off this idea of we want to do something from a systemic perspective because it sounds really big, really hard, really yeah. complex. Yeah, yeah. And I think the thing that's deceptive there is the assumption that if you make something simpler, it's going to be easier to be successful. Hmm. And... This actually seldom turns out to be true if you're dealing with real world problems. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the phrases we use is it arbitrarily ignoring complexity doesn't make it go away. And so what really we've been focusing on, and I think it's the new trend in the field right now, is this idea that you can look at big complex systems in a way that isn't overwhelming that doesn't require a PhD or a Cray computer, and that you can actually take big complex problems and apply reasonably manageable methodology mm -hmm. to say, all right, I'm going to understand the big problem. I'm going to figure out how to do a solution that's big enough to matter. Yeah. And then I'm going to evolve that working with people to get them all on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Jenny, maybe on the examples you were talking about, Many times to solve an emergency response situation, you have to stand things up from nothing and work within the constraints that are presented to you where different chains of command, different people are activating. It can feel very chaotic. What is that experience like and how do you come at it with some kind of framework and approach that allows you to genuinely add value. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because in emergencies, it's very upfront and in your face. But I think most leaders today, if they're good leaders, face the same kind of challenges. Maybe Amazon's come into your market. Maybe there are piranhas chewing at the bottom. Maybe there's new tech or just new ways of working. I think it's really about saying, okay, the world is changing. My market is changing. In an emergency, it's very clear there has yeah. been a huge earthquake and everything has changed overnight. So it's like a, a big asteroid kind of coming down. But you have to do something. You can't be the Titanic and say, we're big enough to just keep going towards that iceberg and we'll be fine. You have to yeah. say, I need to act in uncertainty, what happens next? And once you say that, if you step back and, and look at the big, bigger picture, we talk about sometimes having an out of business experience and say, what's happening in the market? What's happening mm. around me? And then how do I knit together the pieces? Maybe it's the technology, maybe it's social attitudes and beliefs, maybe it's government regulation to say, and so here's how I'm going to act. Mm -hmm. And when you look at entrepreneurs today who are changing the game, that's what they're doing. They're not just saying I have 
one new piece of tech, I have a new sense of technology and that's going to change the world. And when you look at the the bigger companies, Apple became a trillion dollar company because it had an ecosystem strategy. Yeah. And that kind of strategy is being implemented all the way down to big and small companies. How do you act in uncertainty? How do you see the bigger picture? And then how do you take a piece of that bigger picture and move forward? Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the, the Godfather films, the, the wartime consigliere where, you know, you ask Robert Duvall to help you out when things get real. And, and I think there is an element of things getting real for everyone in the last couple of years. And a lot of the longer term, say a five year strategic plan that was basically replicating year one, four times with some incremental growth, those types of models are dying and are being disrupted and replaced with more responsive, more flexible, more dynamic models. Dan, I'd love to hear a little more from you on how you interact and how you help organizations and systems and, and bigger groups address some of the dynamic changes that we're facing these days. You know, I think it's interesting to see how people respond when they realize their five-year plan isn't going to work for them. Yeah. And this goes to a lot of what we work with people on, but you know, there's really a broader lesson here. I think even than that, a lot of the initial reaction is to say, we've got to become more nimble. We've got to become more agile. Yeah. And it's an open field runner that dashes left and then dashes right. And we whack them all this and we whack them all that. Hmm. And organizations certainly get some benefit from being able to respond quickly to an immediate insider input. Yeah. But the truth is for these bigger, deeper changes and whether this is true, whether it's in a crisis response, in reinventing education mm -hmm. in reimagining how we're going to deal with climate change. Yeah. You need to have a picture of what the final solution is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a five-year plan of we're going to do this in year one, this in year two, et cetera. What you begin to frame up is this is what the future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And by thinking about that in a system term, so Jenny mentioned, you're going to combine people and organizations and resources and technology. You say, how are all those pieces going to fit together? Mm -hmm. And then you say, that's where we're aiming. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the first big piece of this. Mm -hmm. And then the five-year plan becomes how do we continue to weave our way in that direction? It's yeah. almost like you see the mountain in the distance and then you're walking across the plain, you're going around the rocks, you're going past the rivers, et cetera. Yeah. So you're being responsive in your journey, mm -hmm. but it's being driven by this vision that you have in the future. Yeah. And oftentimes organizations create a small view of a problem just enough to get a few whack-a-mole things that they can do. And yeah. then they're often an acting. Right. The more profitable way in a systems innovators way, what basically says, look at the big problem, mm -hmm. look at the big solution, the whole solution, and then evolve your way between the two. Yeah. And as you were talking about this, it's not just walking in that direction. You're also in some sense dancing in that direction. And you need some choreography. And I did really like that language leadership that you were asserting there, where in many ways it is a dance of life. It is a theater of the world that we're living in and helping folks orchestrate is the other artistic language that is used around navigating some of this. Can you update us a little more on what you mean by choreography and why you chose that language? Jen will jump in, I'm sure at some point, I think the thing that's been really interesting for us is when you look at a history of innovation, each major evolution and new forms of innovation has produced new roles. Mm -hmm. So the le latest round of lean startup product innovation produced the idea of the user experience designer. Yes. And that wasn't a new role that was around 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. In the space of system innovation, where the job is about seeing how different things fit together, how yeah. the whole solution works, you need somebody who's got a big picture perspective, who leverages a generalist perspective of knowledge, mm -hmm. and who's willing to be a rebel and cut across the silos. Mm -hmm. 
when we looked for a good job title in business, yeah, there was nobody who was officially supposed to be thinking big picture, not a specialist, but, but a generalist and who was supposed to violate rules. Yeah. That job didn't, that wasn't a title that existed in business. But if you look over into the arts, mm. there's tons of those names. Yeah. You know, yeah. You mentioned orchestrator, arranger, director, showrunner, yeah. you know, choreographer. We settled on choreographer and that I think reflects the idea that you've got somebody who needs to make multiple pieces work together to create a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I'm riffing on the dance theme right now, but the spontaneity of it and the idea that in some ways you're responding to movement, it does seem like there's much more of a sense and respond feedback that comes from, from this, that, that I think is interesting. Yes. But sense and respond, but it isn't simply I'm randomly responding. The choreographer senses, responds, and then creates with intent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that's different about the system innovation perspective. Yeah. You're not simply dodging your way to the future. Right. You're imagining a future that you want. Yeah. And then evolving your way in that direction. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to be the Seinfeld reference, the Elaine Benes on the dance floor. You want to make sure there is ultimately an end goal that you're achieving along the way. I just wanted to pick up on a theme that you were just both ripping off, riffing off, if that's okay. Sure. I think part of what we're dancing around is that there needs to be this future vision. And I think that actually changes business somehow it changes what you're looking at so previously we lived in this factory world where it was really about output and you had to get as many cars out of that factory as possible mm. and so that was the goal it was how many cars could i get out of the factory and we've evolved now to say okay we really need to look at outcomes what are we really aiming at we're aiming to educate the future okay right. and Often what that means is we say we're aiming to educate the future, but we just need to get a thousand people accredited through this course. And so we move back to these kind of factory um, outputs, although we talk about the lofty outcomes. What the current context of the world, what this complexity, what these systems ask is that we actually use outcomes. And that's, again, a hard thing for organizations to do because it asks them to say, what do you really want to do? What's mm -hmm. your actual goal? Mm -hmm. Is your actual goal to find the leaders of the future? Is that what your institution wants to do? Because then you might go a certain way about that. Is it about educating people for the kinds of jobs we'll have in 10 years? Because yeah. that will look very different. Is it about finding the most brilliant people who, by the way, might be in Mongolia getting a 4.0 MIT score in some of these international courses? Because that looks very different. Yeah. And often when we speak to organizations and we start to uh, talk about those outcomes, it's really a next level down on strategy. Mm -hmm. So an organization has to say, what are we actually doing? What do we really want for the future? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's an important part of succeeding in the world today and succeeding in kind of innovation and change. Yeah, that makes sense. And it reminds me also of the, the Steve Jobs quote that's out there a lot, where a lot of it is learning how to say no, learning what you're not going to do. And what's interesting about what you're putting out there, Jenny, too, is in a, a, picking this up from you, Dan, as well, is that the framing is really important. The the cognitive model, the mental model, the language that you're using to describe the system and in particular ecosystem is language that's very zeitgeisty these days. People like to talk about ecosystems. So Jenny, what you were touching a little bit on learning, I'd love to get both of your perspectives a little more on the concept of learning ecosystems and how they're evolving and how people might think about affecting change adopting systems thinking and applying it to a learning context. Maybe beginning with you, Dan, any thoughts on the language around ecosystem and then drilling a little bit further down into the world of learning? Yeah. If we take an example from the world of learning, there was a real trend a few years ago to take the newly available tablets and put them into classrooms and to put them into places 
like crisis situations where you might not have other educational opportunities. Yeah. And it was really exciting technology, right? You could deliver a lot of stuff on that. In almost all of those cases, the technology solution, the small idea was something that didn't actually go very far. And it suffered the same fate that a lot of technology in classrooms have. Mm -hmm. If you take a systems innovation perspective and stretch back and start looking at what's around tablet, one of the projects that I had a chance to witness had a great research on the design of the technology. And then they put it in the classroom and realized that all the teachers needed to change the way they taught. Right. And then they also needed new curriculums and new content. And that content required an entirely new ecosystem to create that. Yeah. And then it also required a new ecosystem of support around the school itself. Mm -hmm. And so when you stepped back and you saw all the pieces that fit together, that was where the value was coming from. Jenny was saying it was a mistaken view of focusing on just that piece of technology is that's what we're trying to do right. versus we're trying to transform education and we're going to use this as one piece of a broader system to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard the difference between technology driven innovation versus technology enabled innovation where the technology may enable capabilities, which is great getting back to your vision for the future. If ultimately it helps you get closer to that, great, but it's not like what's the new technology and then once I decide the technology that I need, what are the systems implications from that point forward? That's almost putting the cart before the horse. But how about the future of work is something we talk a lot about and looking ahead at where the world is going. The two of you think about this a lot, maybe beginning with you, Jenny, where do you see the world of work heading? It's a great question. So without going into uh all of the tech changes and AI and what it's going to mean for us, which I'm sure you've done in episodes before. I think the world of work in the future is going to be about how do we create value and what kind of value can we create? And so if you create the outcome around that, then you start to say, what do humans do really well that, that maybe other, other parts of technology can't? And what we do really well is we weave things which are very different, which may not seem obvious together. So I think in any sector, it's thinking about that. What can we weave together? How can we take a step back and look at that big picture? And an example I saw really recently, which I thought was brilliant, was uh, Doctors Without Borders have a program in Yemen, Syria, some of the hardest to reach places in the world where they've said, how are we going to support people to access prosthetics in the middle of crisis, war, mm. drought, hunger? And the program looks like there's this new sets of technology. And if we could scan limbs, faces, all kinds of burn victims or otherwise, and if we could pair that with brilliant telemedicine of doctors, therapists around the world, mm. And if we could pair that again with 3D printers and digital manufacturing in these kind of areas or countries, yeah. and then people who can actually access that, maybe in the future that might be drone technology, then we can link up sensors, possibly AI, you know, telemedicine, big data, um, and manufacturing to give these people customized, flexible you know, these prosthetics are sometimes the color of their skin arranged in a way that is relevant to their everyday movements, the kind of support that would just be impossible and is cheaper and faster than ever before. Yeah. And I think that is incredible value. So when you live in a time with big opportunities and big threats, how do we think about creating that big value by knitting different things together? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. It reminds me, the, the, the language that I hear there too is composable. The component tree is modular and you're almost sensing where you can connect a few nodes to unlock unexpected value. You're nodding, Dan, which, which I think is a good indication. 
Yeah, yeah. The thing that I like about Jen's example is so much about future of work is often framed in the sense of how is the work that we do today going to be different because we're telecommuting yeah. or et cetera. Yeah. And it doesn't really imagine that the work itself may be different. Mm -hmm. And the future of work, the work itself is going to shift to this big composability. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the examples that I was really lucky to be introduced to a few years ago is I was speaking at a conference with Hen Hobieka. And she was a teenager who was competing in a technology competition in the Middle East. And she came in third place with a set of goggles that swimmers could wear that would allow them to get their pulse beats while they're training mm -hmm. as a swimmer. And she was a you know competitive swimmer. And she went home to Lebanon feeling quite proud of herself, coming in number three in this televised competition, and went on with the rest of her life for about two weeks until Nike called her and said, so where are your goggles? <laughs> and from Lebanon, hmm. she knit together a team that was in Europe, in Asia, in U.S., mm. to compose, design, develop, and build prototypes of these new goggles mm. as a teenager, or actually early 20s at that point, yeah, from a place where nobody would think of as the hub of, of innovation and work. Yeah. And I think when you start imagining that people can do that, that's going to be what's driving the future of work. It's yeah. not going to be, how do we get our offices to work more effectively via Zoom? Right. It's going to be, somebody can have an idea in Beirut and produce something for Nike by weaving together an entire web of folks across the world. Yeah. And that's going to be what's going to be so exciting about the future. Yeah, it's fascinating. It reminds me of the Alan Kay quote that I use often, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. It's becoming easier to invent things if you have the right mindset and the right access levels. How do we address that part of the problem? In some ways, you're doing that by educating folks. How do you activate against this transformation that you're describing? It sounds like as consultants, you're tapped in to do this, but is there a broader groundswell happening here? Let me talk about the broader groundswell for just a moment. I think I can talk for both of us when I say being a system innovator was a lonely thing a few years ago. The aid sector was really interesting because it had very visible system innovation problems. Mm -hmm. And that's in many ways what brought us together is we were both looking at this problem-rich environment yeah. that, that had a lot of these challenges. But there wasn't a wide recognition that this is what, you know, needed to be done. Mm -hmm. About a year ago, all of a sudden, it was like somebody threw a switch. Mm -hmm. And... Everybody had the same aha moment, it seemed, at the same time. I was working with a UN conference, and whereas before everybody had been coming to this, you know, group and basically talking about, I've got this piece of technology, I've got this piece of technology, all at once, everybody who was presenting was talking about the system changes that they were driving. Mm -hmm. And this has just continued over the last year and a half. There is, I think, a groundswell recognition that the problems are bigger and more complex and that the solutions need to be more ambitious. Yeah. So then I think the challenge is how do individuals, how do organizational leaders, et cetera, get on board with responding to that level of realization? Yeah. And one of the ways in which I hear that being solved is by acting locally and thinking on a very local level. It's something that's been coming up a lot in conversations around ed educational innovation, just because K-12 in particular is challenging to change. And then higher ed is also another one where people frequently throw up their hands and say, it's hard to change the system. But then the response frequently is, can you get a small intentional community to be able to do something meaningfully different? If I'm hearing you right, you're actually addressing this in a somewhat different way. So can you respond a little bit to whether localization is in fact the right way to respond to this? Or do you have some other perspective? I think you act at the level that you have leverage. 
you act at the level that makes sense to you. Mm. You act at the level that you care about acting at. You don't want to limit yourself to your local high school or your local area, mm. but you don't want to push yourself into kind of the global education sector if that's not what you care about. Innovation and change is very much driven by passion and and wanting to do something. Localization, decentralization is certainly one of the themes that is growing in a globalized world. But what I would challenge in that assumption is doesn't matter if you're working at your own high school level or or your state level, everybody should be lifting their head up and say, what is the bigger problem here and how do I solve it? Mm -hmm. Because it may be that what you're working on will only work for your community, or it may be that what you're working on is actually going to be significant for the country or the world. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that certainly in innovations that we've grown globally and supported to grow globally, mm -hmm. that someone said, this would be really good for this one community. And then as they scaled and expanded, they realized that same issue existed across another 17 countries. Yeah. The and more you can look up early, the better. Yeah. And find a community of interest, a community of practice, other folks who are solving similar problems. And then frequently making those lateral connections is another way to drive innovation as well, particularly in, in education, which as we're getting further on in the conversation, are there components out there that you think could be leveraged by education, but haven't quite snapped in yet? Because that's something that, that I've looked at a lot throughout my career. Can you borrow from innovation in media and entertainment? Can you borrow from things that are happening in, in other sectors? It's also something as I've spent more time as a consultant, when you tap into different industries, in some ways it helps you make those types of connections because you aren't overly siloed in your thinking. Dan, do you have any perspective on where you think some of the innovation could happen or, or how folks uh, maybe could get activated within systems thinking around educational innovation? Yeah, I think following on your observations of the value of looking outside the practices that you're familiar with, in some cases, people, I think of that as, well, I'm going to look for where a particular piece of technology has been used or a particular specific practice has been used. Yeah. And certainly you don't want to ignore that sort of thing. But I think it's much more powerful to look for different systems, different ecosystems, different ways of creating value than other areas use and trying to bring those in because that's going to allow you to challenge the status quo in a bigger way. Yeah. And we talked earlier about this danger of small and simple, embracing the fact that your biggest challenges here may be tending to be too small. So when you go to borrow, borrow big ideas, borrow complex things mm. and, and think about how they might fit and map into the world that you're working on. Yeah. That's where I would go at this stage. The other observation I would make is that when you're sitting in your own field in the past, you would just talk to other people in your own field. There's so much opportunity today to bring together diverse actors mm. that never collaborated before. Mm-hmm. Imagine you've got a self-driving car, that self-driving car, you're going to put your kids in and they're going to drive to school. You're not even going to have to be in the car. What could you do with kids locked in a space for 45 minutes? Right. I mean, right. What an incredible educational environment. Mm -hmm. So what are educators and Ford Motor Company doing together. And I think this ability to see adjacently, just because it increases the scope of your toolkit is also really exciting. Yeah. A really powerful theme that Dan's touching on there is unbundling or rebundling, which I think we're seeing in the education system, but could be really exciting. You've got an entire course at your high school or university or, or learning center and you say, do you know what? We could just do this part of a course, but we could put it out um, alongside, I don't know, medical students. So we could put it out alongside older learners or part of pharmacies or wherever that might be. We can move this somewhere else. 
or the kind of re-bundling, which might be typically it's, okay, how do we match this course with a work program or an innovation hub? Mm -hmm. But what other actors might you say, if we're starting to look at the most brilliant minds in the world, what might we need to bundle together for um, our friend in Lebanon or our friend in Mongolia or our friend sitting in New York? Yeah. What would really make them um, ready for the future of work? What would really make them ready to become the next Einstein? And I think that's where this gets exciting, using those kind of ecosystem strategies, personalization strategies, and say, what could we create? Yeah. And the cool thing about rebundling is that when you rebundle, you don't have to create the same rebundling for everybody. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to imagine that freshman level calculus course with hundreds of students all staring at the same material. We can really rebundle not only the content, but the instructional model, the place, the, you know, purpose, all these things can be rehooked together in ways that are customized and tailored so we can create systems of value. Yeah. That are really tailored to individual needs and opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. You got, so you got me, I'm in. So how, how do people learn how to become uh, better systems thinkers? Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what innovation ecosystem is, but also if there's any resources out there or places that you would recommend people go or think about or understand better, what does it take to, to start to ramp up as a systems innovator? Well, of course, of course, I would be so welcome to come to innovationecosystem.com, find us on Twitter, find us on LinkedIn. We have a book coming out early next year around how do you do system innovation? And I think specifically that is you don't need to change the entire system of racism or education, but here's how you do it as a, from a practical standpoint, as an entrepreneur or business or otherwise. Mm -hmm. This is an emerging field, and there's a lot of new materials being written. The things that I would recommend are understand like the four big things that you need to be aware of. Hmm. You need to aspire to see a big goal, a big outcome that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. You need to begin by looking at the broader problem. And there's a lot of techniques for looking at broader problems. You need to imagine a complete solution of the future. And then you need to evolve between the two. Mm -hmm. And those techniques, there's a lot of pieces out there right now. One of the reasons we're working on the book is because that hasn't really been pulled together. Yeah. But I think it's really about taking that step back and saying, those are the four things that I'm going to charge myself with doing mm -hmm. and approaching challenges in that big way. Yeah. Yeah, it's great stuff. We're joined today by Dan McClure and Jenny Wild from Innovation Ecosystem. They are systems innovators. Hopefully folks' uh, appetites have been appropriately whetted for uh, systems thinking and how it might impact innovation. I'd like to give you both that opportunity to close, just some concluding thoughts to help folks synthesize what we may have covered today and what they may want to take with them into the rest of their lives. So maybe beginning with you, uh, Jenny, and then concluding with you, Dan, uh, any concluding thoughts uh, as we're wrapping up? Again, thanks so much for joining us on today's show. Yeah, thanks, Mike. The world is changing. Think bigger. Come join us and let's change the systems of the world. There you go. Yeah, and I think... Education has such a unique role in this. Education as a system itself is being reinvented. The education that we knew in the last century is not going to be the way we're going to do education even in the next decade. Yeah. But also education is the fuel behind all this creativity. Reinventing education actually allows us to do all the rest of the system innovation in the world. Yeah. And so I think educators in particular have a really crucial role in making all of this possible. And as Jenny said, it's really exciting. That's fantastic. I want to thank again, Dan and Jenny, thank you for joining us on Trending in Education. Thanks, Thanks very much. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe, tell a friend, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. Thanks as always for listening. This is Trending in Education.